The subject for today deals with yet another, another lesson that is found in the book of Numbers. Uh, we're continuing with our so-called journey in that book, a journey that is filled with many different lessons. And even this, this subject today, the subject of the 12 spies, can probably, uh, we can probably spend quite a lot of time just on dealing with that one, one uh, story in the Bible. But there's one particular point that I want to draw out from this lesson. As you can see, the title is The 12 Spies and the Lesson on Faith. We're going to look at one particular aspect of faith. Because in these last days, God wants to have a people that will walk by faith. And there's a valuable lesson in the story of the 12 spies that helps us. In fact, not just in the story, the, the story of the 12 uh, spies, sorry, not tribes, uh, was just the culmination and demonstration of two kinds of faith. We're going to see what they are. But that story is also based on what we have seen thus far. And that's why I just want to take a minute now to remind us of this journey of the Israelites and why we are studying the book of Numbers. The Israelites, the people of God, were in Egypt. And uh, we, we remember that they spent over 400 years in Egypt. But ultimately, it got to the point where uh, they were no longer living the way God intended for them to live in the beginning of that settlement into the Egyptian area. We remember that it was the need for physical needs that brought them in that region. But time passed on, and little by little, not only did things change for the Israelites, but they themselves also began to change. They were starting to get acquainted with the life of the Egyptians. And they began to forget what God had promised them and Abraham. You see, Egypt wasn't the promised land. God had promised their ancestors that he was going to take that people into a particular kind of land, a special land, a land where milk and honey flows. And in order to do that, God raised the prophet by the name of Moses, who was going to facilitate that exodus and was going to be an instrument, an instrument in the hands of the Lord to take that people so they can be brought to the fulfillment of that promise that God had given Abraham and them, the promised land. So through different circumstances and things that took place in Egypt, the Lord was able to begin that journey for that people. And we covered some of these aspects up until now in that journey. We learned a little bit about that journey. And today we're getting to the point where that people is actually already right there at the border of that promised land. And this is when this event, this story of the 12 spies takes place. So we are going to open our Bible now and we're going to reread the story. We're not going to go through the whole chapter. We're going to focus, however, on at least half of the chapter, just so that we are refreshed and reminded of the word of God and um, the story of the 12 tribes. So we can then see what it is that we want to learn from this particular event that took place in the life of God's people in the Israelites. So I have my Bible at Numbers chapter 13, and I'm just going to read verse 2, and then we're going to jump ahead into the latter portion of that of that chapter. And here's how everything begins. Actually, let me start with verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel of every tribe of their fathers. Shall we send the men, everyone a ruler among them? And then these 12 uh, representatives of, the, of all the tribes are being chosen. And they're given the um, direction to go on and examine that land. And I just want to stop here at this verse just for one second, because I want, to, I want us to take with something with us and keep it in the back of our minds. And it deals with the fact with respect to why was it that God needed to send those spies into the promised land? 
Have you thought about that? Does not God know everything that is in that land? Does God need people to go on and just and, and check and make sure that what God had said before was indeed true? Absolutely not. We, we serve a God who knows all things. God does not need to send me or you or anybody for that matter to examine areas in order to make sure that he understands what that area is. God was very familiar with the land of Canaan. He knew exactly what was in the land of Canaan. But there was a reason as to why he wanted to send these men there. And we we're going to come back to that reason at the end. So I want us to keep that in mind. I want us to keep this verse in the back of our heads. Why was it that these men were sent by the Lord to examine that land? So now, as I said earlier, these 12 individuals are chosen from every tribe, a representative, and Moses gives them directions in the next few verses and tells them, go on, look at that land. Is it what God had promised us? Who lives there? What kind of a, a land is it, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And then now we're going to jump to verse 21, and we're going to finish the chapter and see how things continue and what it is that takes place. So starting here at verse 21, the Bible says, So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And, get, and they came unto the brook of Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely, surely they say, it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong and dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites, Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the man that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? This is what we see in this passage of the scriptures. Dear brothers and sisters, among the many different lessons, as we mentioned, we see one very important thing. We have the same people going through the same experiences, 
having the same circumstances. And yet among that people, we see two different groups. We know the story. We know what happened. We know what the consequences are, were here because of the choice of the majority. So why is it that the Israelites right there at the brings of the Jordan, having gone through everything that they did, having spent 430 plus years in Egypt, in a place of bondage, were not able to possess the land, the place that God had promised them. I want to share with you a statement found in the Review and Herald that is uh, two paragraphs that are found in the same article where the problem is very well described to us. So we can understand what the reason is and what these two groups were. And here in this, in this um, article, Sister White begins and says, as the people listened to this report and gave vent to their disappointment in bitter reproaches and wailing, they did not wait to reflect and reason that God who had brought them out thus far would certainly give them the land. They left God out of the question. They acted as though in the taking of the city of Jericho, the key to the land of Canaan, they must depend solely on the power of arms, the arm of flesh. God had declared that he would give them the country and they should have fully trusted him to fulfill his word. But their unsubdued hearts were not in harmony with his plans. They did not reflect how wonderfully he had wrought in their behalf, bringing them out of their Egyptian bondage. And I have underlined this because it is this phrase here that is connected with the subject that we're going to be looking at today. They did not reflect, they did not reflect how wonderfully he had wrought in their behalf, bringing them out of their Egyptian bondage, cutting a path for them through the waters of the sea and destroying the pursuing host of Pharaoh. Caleb and Joshua, the two who of all the 12 spies trusted in the word of God, rent their clothes in distress when they perceived the, that these unfavorable reports had discouraged the whole camp. They endeavored to reason with them, but the congregation were filled with madness and disappointment and refused to listen to these two men. Finally, C Caleb urged his way to the front and his clear ringing voice was heard above all the clamor of the multitude. He opposed the cowardly views of his fellow spies, which had weakened the faith and courage of all Israel. They played a major role to pass on and weaken the faith of the rest of the camp of Israel. What we see here to us presented in this story is two groups of people. And the main difference between these two groups of people boils down to that one word, faith. We had a group of people with faith and a group of people with a weakened faith or lack of faith. And that is the lesson we're going over today. We want to understand something very particular when it comes to faith. We want to understand what it is, and most importantly, how was it, or how is it, just not, not just back then, that we are able to grow in faith. So that when the Lord brings us individually, before whatever the Jordan might be in our own lives, we're going to be from among those who demonstrate the same spirit and faith that Joshua and Caleb had in themselves. 
One of the most popular verses with respect to faith found in the Bible is the one in Hebrews chapter 11. I'm sure we are all familiar with that verse. But I want us to pick at that verse. I want us to meditate upon that verse. I'm reminded of a statement in the testimonies where Ellen White says that we are to take a verse and to do what with it? To meditate on it. To try to understand the thought in that verse. And that's what I want us to do today. I want us to spend some time here and learn one particular lesson when it comes to faith. There are many lessons when it comes to faith, but I want us to focus and, uh, and, and, and bring in one very important lesson that I believe is found in this very verse that we see here and that we read so very often. In Hebrews 11, the Bible says that faith is the substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And now I want us to focus on that word substance. Faith is the substance. The word substance is the Greek word hypostasis. And it's translated as substance only in this verse here in, in Hebrews 1.11. It's a word that's used very sparingly in the New Testament. I think it's, it's, uh, we can find it only three or four times in the New Testament. But that word substance is in reference to confidence and assurance. So faith is the confidence or assurance of things hoped for. In fact, when we look at some of the modern translations, notice how it is translated in the NIV. It says faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So faith is based on confidence. And the ESV says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So what is faith? Well, just by looking at this verse, we see that faith has something tangible behind it. And I say that because of the words that are used in this verse. Faith is based on assurance and confidence. Well, can you have an empty assurance? What kind of an assurance is an empty assurance? It's an oxymoron, right? There's no such thing as an empty assurance. You know, brothers and sisters, I believe that God wants to prepare us to cross the Jordan. But in order for us to be able to do that, we have to make sure that we do not re, uh, repeat the mistakes of the past. Here we're looking at a primary example of a primary major mistake that was done in the past. We want to make sure that we understand that God works in our lives in order to prepare us to have the faith that is needed for us in order to be overcomers and ultimately to be ready for translation. Well, the faith that God wants you and I to have is actually a faith that is based on assurance and confidence. It is not based on an empty promise. So how does God do that? How is it that God makes sure that we grow in faith and that we can find assurance and confidence in order to have more of it? This morning, I want to introduce you to a phrase that is found in the writings of Ellen White quite a lot. I don't know how many of you have heard this phrase or have come across this phrase. Experimental knowledge. But it is experimental knowledge that gives us and helps us to have that faith and assurance. And this is why when you go into the EGW um, app and you put in the word experimental knowledge, you will find over 400 hits. Ellen White spent quite a lot of time talking about experimental knowledge. And she spent quite a lot of time talking about experimental knowledge because it is through experimental knowledge that the Lord brings us to a position of where we can have enough faith. It is through experimental knowledge that the Lord prepares us and helps us to have assurance 
and confidence in him and grow in faith. Well, what is experimental knowledge? What is experimental? It is something that is known by experiment or trial. And that's why experimental knowledge is the most valuable. It's the most valuable because it's the most certain and the most safely to be trusted. It is because experimental knowledge brings us confidence and assurance. And it's something that the Lord uses in order to prepare you and I to be able to cross the Jordan. There are many little Jordans that we need to cross. There, there's a Red Sea that we need to cross. And, and, and that could be different for all of us, depending on where we are in our character growth, depending on what difficulties we face. You know, the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. The Lord knew the Israelites better than they knew themselves. And here now, I want to give an illustration of how experimental knowledge helps us to get through whatever comes our way in our lives. And I'm going to do, try to present to you an experiment that if we were in person would have worked much greater, but I'm going to try everything possible in order to relate a thought here through this little experiment that unfortunately we're going to have to visually or virtually observe rather than have it done here uh, live because we're not in person. Do any of you recognize who this individual is on, uh, on the picture here? It's Galileo. And Galileo is staring. He's looking at this chandelier that you see. And he's looking at the chandelier because the chandelier was moving back and forth. Now, physics is not my stronghold. So I'm not going to spend too much time here teaching you about physics. But at this time, what Galileo was observing was something that had become known as the law of the pendulum. He actually spent quite a lot of time observing pendulums. And he came to many different conclusions. But I want to use this law of the pendulum to illustrate this example to you that I want to connect with this understanding of experimental knowledge. Have any of you taken part in an experiment where you are asked to be used as a prop in order to demonstrate how the law of the pendulum works? I don't see any hands going up. Have you ever seen this experiment done before? Now, I I've seen that done quite a few times, so I'm fairly acquainted with it. And this is what I want to illustrate here. So. When we look at a pendulum, if you take a pendulum, if you were to take this heavy 20-pound uh, bowl and suspend it from the ceiling and take it from its resting position, which is right in the middle, and bring it right in front of your face, if you are to let go of that bowl and, and, and allow this pendulum to swing, this pendulum will go all the way back to the other side and then come back to your face, but it will stop just probably a few millimeters be, uh, before its initial releasing point. Now, as I said, unfortunately, I cannot demonstrate this to you in person, so I'm going to try to use the language now. Whenever you see somebody or whenever somebody in the audience is being asked to come in and to take this position, usually nine out of 10 times, nine out of 10 times, the person who has never seen this experience before who has never uh, uh, heard of it would jump out of their position as soon as they see the pendulum swinging back and coming close to their face. Nine out of 10 times. Even though you have explained to them how it works. But you know, someone like myself, someone who has seen that experiment done so many different times, I no longer fear that ball swinging back because I know how the law of the pendulum works. First, I will stop as to the law of the pendulum. Then I observed others go through this experience. I was in the audience and I was looking at people who were volunteering to see this experiment work. 
And then thirdly, I myself at uh, that last stage volunteered. And now I know that when this ball comes back to my face, it is actually not going to hit me. And I am not afraid, even though I see it swinging with its speed back to my face. And this, brothers and sisters, is how experimental knowledge works. When you have experienced something, unlike the individual who is introduced for the very first time to the pendulum, you have something to put your assurance into. You have seen it. You have seen others go through it. You yourself has, have gone through it. Now you know that when you see that ball coming back, you don't need to jump out of the way. And this is what the Lord wants to do for you and I. This is why the Lord uses experimental knowledge in order to have our faith grow. Because he knows that when we go through these different experiences, when we step in, and take part in what we are going to call now the spiritual law of the pendulum. We are going to have something tangible. I want to share with you now only two of those statements that I mentioned earlier that are found in the writings of Ellen White. Just to see how important experimental knowledge is in our daily growth of faith. In this statement here, Sister White says, it is not safe to be occasional Christians, right? We don't want to be occasional Christians. We want to be like Joshua and Caleb, Christians who are ready to do what needs to be done. Christians who are ready to possess the promised land. We must be Christ-like in all our actions always. And then through grace, we're safe for time and for eternity. And notice what she says. The experimental knowledge of the grace received in times of trial is of more value than gold or silver. Why is it of more value? Because now you have something tangible to look back to. You have something where you can put your assurance. You have something that has demonstrated to you that God is all powerful and that he can take you through. It confirms, she continues, it confirms the trusting, believing one grow in. We have an ever present helper in Jesus Christ and gives us a firmness, a boldness in God that will take him at his word and trust him with unwavering faith. Do you see how this works? Do you see why faith is the substance, the assurance? The confidence. Because it becomes tangible as we continue to walk with the Lord. She says that will take him at his word and trust him with unwavering faith. When brought into most trying positions, the wonderful counselor will be his strength. And in volume two of the testimony, she says, many look to their ministers to bring the light from God to them, seeming to think this a cheaper way than to be the trouble of going to God for it themselves. And now I just want to stop here just to make sure we are not reading this um, statement in a vacuum, because that doesn't mean that God doesn't have shepherds under shepherds and that God doesn't speak to us even through ministers. Absolutely not. But um, what she's trying to tell us here is that the Lord is calling us to do more as individuals. And this should even be the minister's thought when he comes in to share something. His thought should be as to how he can stimulate the listener to grow their relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is what we see here in this statement. We want to make sure that we all as individuals go in Christ daily. And in order for us to grow in Christ daily, we ought to make sure that we as individuals work on that relationship with him. We're not to be uh, once a week Christians. The growth in Christ continues on a day-to-day -day basis. So she continues here and says, if they would daily follow Christ and make him their guide and counselor, they might obtain a clear knowledge of his will and thus be gaining a valuable experience. 
For want of this very experience, brethren professing the truth walk in the sparks of others kindling. They are unacquainted with the spirit of God and have not a knowledge of his will and are therefore easily moved from their faith. They are unstable because they trusted in others to obtain an experience for them. And I want to stop here for just a second. Brothers and sisters, this is why the Israelites did not cross into the promised land. It is because the majority of them did not trust in the Lord, but rather listened to the weakened faith of those 10 spies. It is because the majority of people there among the Israelites failed to recognize all that the Lord had done for them. They had failed to realize all the experimental knowledge that they had gone through in the past, not just several weeks, but months and everything that the Lord had done for them and for their ancestors. This is why Israel did not cross the promised land. The statement finishes, ample provisions have been made for every son and daughter of Adam and Adam to obtain individually a knowledge of the divine will to perfect Christian character and to be purified through the truth. God is dishonored by the class who profess to be followers of Christ and yet have what? Have no experimental knowledge of the divine will or of the mystery of godliness. God is dishonored when we even ignore and we'll see that just in a second because remember Joshua, Caleb, the 10 spies and all of Israel went through the same set of experiences. They went through the same circumstances. But yet the two of them were able to look back and to build that experimental knowledge of the divine will through these circumstances and everything that took place in their life while the rest of Israel dishonored God. Because they did not. So speaking of them. Now let's look back. Let's come back to uh, the Israelites. And see. Did God provide them. With experimental knowledge. Was there something. The Israelites could put their trust into. Was there something. That God did for them. In order for them to have assurance. And confidence. Of God's power. So that when he brought them to the Jordan, they knew that regardless of what was in that land, they already had built on that experimental knowledge. And they already knew that just as God has done in the past, he will do for them again. Well, I think we remember everything that the Lord did, don't we? Going all the way back to Egypt. How many times did the Lord have to manifest his power to this people? Did he not turn Aaron's rod into a serpent? Did he not take them? Did he not take Egypt through these 10 different plagues? You see, the Lord doesn't need to go through 10 plagues. The Lord can make things work instantly. But he knew that as he allows the people of God to behold these things, as, as he allows the people of God to behold his power and uh, all these miracles that were taking place, one by one, the Lord was doing these things so the people can grow and have assurance and something tangible to put their faith in. He wanted their faith to grow. And we come out of Egypt and what do we see? Pharaoh changing his mind instantly. Again, the Lord brought them to a place where was no escape. And he did what? Parted the Red Sea. Not only did he part the Red Sea, not only did that people walk on dry land, but as soon as they had crossed, he delivered them from all the chariots and Pharaoh's army. Time after time is what the Lord was, uh, these things were so that the Lord could take that people and give them something of a substance so their faith can grow. And you know what? 
we have a confirmation in this in patriarchs and prophets. Notice what she says here in commenting upon the experience of the Israelites as God was preparing to take them out of the land of Egypt. She says the Hebrews had expected to obtain their freedom without any special trial of their faith or any real suffering or hardship. This is where they were in their spiritual journey. In Egypt, as God was getting ready to take that people out, they had not enough faith. So what is it that God does in order for them to have more faith? She continues, but they were not yet prepared for deliverance. They had little faith in God and were unwilling patiently to endure their afflictions until he should see fit to work for them. Many were content to remain in bondage rather than meet the difficulties attending removal to a strange land. And the habits of some had become so much like those of the Egyptians that they preferred to dwell in Egypt. And what does the Lord do? Therefore, the Lord did not deliver them by the first manifestation of his power before Pharaoh. Could God have done that? Absolutely. We serve an all-powerful God. He could deliver them just with one act, one miracle. But there was a reason why he did not do that. And it's because these people, they lack faith. So now they had to go on a journey. There had to be all of these experiences. All of that experimental knowledge had to be there so these people can grow in faith and have a substance. And recognize that substance so they can put their trust in him. She continues, he overruled events more fully to develop the tyrannical spirit of the Egyptian king and also to reveal himself to his people. Beholding his justice, his power, and his love, they would choose to leave Egypt and give themselves to his service. The task of Moses would have been much less difficult had not many of the Israelites become so corrupted that they were unwilling to leave Egypt. The majority, even back there in Egypt, had not enough faith. And it didn't end there, did it? Even after the Red Sea crossing, being delivered from the uh, Egyptian army, God continued to manifest his power day after day. He gave them water to drink. He gave them food to eat. Manifestation after manifestation. He was taking them on a journey. He wanted to make sure that these people grow in faith. So that when they come there to the Jordan, they were going to have enough of it. Do you remember what I mentioned in the beginning as we started reading from Revelation? Uh, sorry, not Revelation. Numbers 13. We read at verses 1 and 2. And, then, and, and we stopped for a second and we asked, why was it that God send those people to spy out that land the reason why god sent that people to spy out that land was so that god can take them to the very last step and confirm to them that what he had promised them in the past that what he promised abraham that what he promised them was indeed true Canaan was indeed a land of milk and honey. Canaan was indeed the place that God had promised them. And by showing them that, he wanted to finalize their faith and point them back to all of these instances of all of these different experiences in the past. But unfortunately, only two of those individuals recognized that. Only two of those individuals for themselves had built on that experimental knowledge and on faith and were ready to go and possess the land. Even though all of these people had gone through the same experiences, they faced the same circumstances. And brothers and sisters, this morning we're studying this because this was not just a lesson that was left for the Israelites. You and I today have to cross the Jordan. You and I today have to go through the Red Sea. What about your life? 
Are you growing in faith? Have you recognized the things that God has done for you in the past? Or are you ignoring all of these things, not building on that experimental knowledge that the Lord wants you to have? You see, when we looked at that example of um, the pendulum, as I mentioned to you before, nine out of 10, maybe even 10 out of 10 times, when that pendulum, when you are there for the very first time taking place in that experiment, almost all the time, people would jump out when they see that pendulum swinging back, coming close to their face. You see, how do we grow in faith? What does the Bible say when it comes to faith? How does one ac acquire more faith? Faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing comes by the word of God. So by studying all of these things that we see in the Bible, by, by hearing about them, we get acquainted. We begin that journey of forming experimental knowledge. Just it was with myself when it comes to that experiment with the pendulum. You see, I, the first thing that uh, helped me not to be afraid of the pendulum swinging back to my face was somebody explaining to me what the law of the pendulum is. I learned of it. And in like manner, we learn of the Lord. How do we do that? By opening our Bible on a regular basis. And then what was my second step? in no longer being afraid of the pendulum. Well, I actually observed somebody else take part in that experiment. And when I saw that for myself, I received more confidence. And this is why we study the Bible and all of these examples in the Bible, because as we behold the lives of these people, we get more confidence and we grow in faith. But you know what? There's one more thing. We ourselves have to have a personal experience with the Lord. We ourselves have to step in and partake in the experiment of the pendulum. Because the more and more we allow him to manifest his power in our lives, and we recognize that. It's important to recognize that. The more and more our faith is going to grow. And we are indeed, as individuals, going to be prepared for translation and to cross into the heavenly kingdom. You see, in these last days, God is looking for Joshua and Caleb's. Do you remember how many of that people? that were called there or that had come there to uh, to Paran, entered into the promised land. Oops, sorry. How many of these individuals made it into the promised land? Only those two. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. So the question to you that I have to you and to myself today is, are we going to allow the Lord to walk us through the spiritual law of the pendulum and reflect on how wonderfully he has wrought in our behalf in the past? Or are we going to be like the 10 spies who did not build their experimental knowledge, who did not build on the experiences that the Lord took them through in life? How many of you want to be like Joshua and Caleb and come to the point of having the faith that is needed to enter the promised land? I most certainly do. And I desire all of you to be there as well. So here at the end, I just want us to kneel and to petition the Lord to help us not only build that experimental knowledge, not only grow in faith, but to recognize these things. Because I guarantee you, if we look back, if we examine our lives, we'll constantly see his hand working. And also not to be afraid when difficulties and trials come up. It is scary the first time you see that ball swinging back into your face. It is scary. But we are to depend on the Lord 
and to know that he will take us through. So let us now close with a word of prayer and petition him to help us receive the faith that is needed, the faith of Jesus. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for all of these lessons that you have left for us because it is by beholding that we become changed. It is by hearing your word that we grow in faith. It is by getting acquainted with the experiences of all of these people that have walked with you in the past that we receive strength for ourselves. But ultimately, Father, I just want to pray for all of us this morning. I want to pray in us that you help us to recognize the times that you have led us in the past. I, I pray that we can build of, on our individual experiences. Father, I pray and ask that you help us not to be afraid when we face trials and temptation. I recall so many times when I have jumped out of the way and taken things into my own hands, not trusting in you. And I pray, Father, that you will bring us to a place where we all as individuals are not going to jump out of the way, but rather trust in you and allow you to take us through time and time again because we know that you want us to have faith that is tangible that is a substance that is built on assurance of the things that you have done for us and for your people in the past lord i want to pray for every person that is here lord we we all have different difficulties we all come from different places and, and we're in a different position in our journey. But ultimately, Father, we know that one day all of us are going to have one and the same faith. And the faith that is spoken of in the Bible is the faith of Jesus. And just by looking at Jesus, we know that by going through everything that he did through his walk on earth, by experiencing you and your power in his life, he was able to go through to the end, even at the cross. He knew that once he had put his trust in you and in your will, things were going to come according to that which you had planned, not just for him, but for all of us sinners. So we want to do the same. We want to trust in Christ just as he trusted in you. And Father, we pray that you give us the strength and whatever that is needed. In fact, Father, we pray that just as the Egyptians, if we need to experience hardships and difficulties, we pray that you bring these upon us so that we can learn the lesson of faith and trust in you. Father, I leave everything into thy hands and I pray and ask all of this in the name of your beloved son, Jesus Christ. Amen.